good cops don't beat confessions out of people. But we all know of circumstances where some police officers in some circumstances have gone a bit too far, or maybe a lot too far, in trying to coerce a confession from people. And this has traditionally, at least, been such a significant problem that the founders, uh, the framers of our Constitution, James Madison specifically, decided that they were going to prohibit this. And they were going to prohibit it by simply saying nobody can be compelled to testify against himself. Uh, and so the idea that you can beat a confession out of somebody, the idea that you can even engage in coercive tactics, the idea that you can even question somebody without first warning him that he has a right to remain silent, all of those things have followed from the Fifth Amendment. And uh, they are a protection against those sorts of very, very intrusive and very aggressive uh, police tactics. This was something that ran in the veins of everyone in colonial times because they all understood the importance of being able to keep private your thoughts and beliefs, especially on topics relating to your political views and your religious views, which were things that people knew the King of England had a great interest in getting from his subjects because if you had the wrong view on the proper allocation of power between the king and his subjects or the wrong view on religion, things weren't going to go very well for you. And so the Fifth Amendment was one of the bedrock principles of English common law that was enshrined in the Constitution. And what it does is to set up a proper balance between the state and the individual about what the state can expect people to do by revealing their thoughts. What is it that you know? What is it you believe? What is it that you've seen? What is it that you remember? What is it that you're able to articulate? The government can't force you to reveal that to them because that robs you of the dignity that you deserve as an individual. The Fifth Amendment is animated by a central predicate, and that central predicate is that there exists an inherently coercive environment when citizens are confronted by police. As a result, the Fifth Amendment erects certain safeguards to protect the interests of citizens, but also protect uh, officers in the exercise of their duty. The due process voluntariness test meant in the case of confessions um, arose in the 1930s in a case called Brown versus Mississippi. What happened in Brown is really instructive because it is one of the reminders that we haven't always had a history of law enforcement in this country of which we can be proud. Um, Brown took place in a rural county in Mississippi um, investigating the murder of a white farmer. Um, the sheriff's department came to suspect a group of illiterate black farmers. And so they went to the home of one of these suspects and they questioned him about his involvement in the murder. And he denied having anything to do with it. So they tied a rope around the neck of this individual and put the other end of the rope over the branch of a tree and hold him up off his feet and hung him. And they let him down before he died and they continued to question him and he continued to deny having anything to do with the rape. So they strung him up again and they strung him up again. Um, eventually they left. But they returned the next day and they put him in a car and they drove the car across the state line into Alabama and they beat him. They took off his shirt and they beat him and they beat him and they beat him. And eventually he confessed to the murder. So they put him in a jail cell. And the next day after that, they went to the two other suspects who you could assume had learned what happened to the first person. And they brought those two other suspects back to the jail cell and they took off their shirts and they tied them over the top of a table. And the deputy sheriff who had gone on the first excursion and had hung the first suspect from the branch of a tree, took off his belt and with his buckle, beat and beat and beat these two suspects until they also confessed. And they were put in a jail cell. And within a matter of about seven days, they were tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. Unreliability of confessions is so important, not only to citizens, but to police officers. 
The DNA revolution has taught us so very much. One of the biggest lessons we've learned from law enforcement use of DNA is that innocent people are in jail. DNA evidence have been used to exonerate innocent people. Now, these cases where people were exonerated leave a very distinct footprint in the sand. That is, when scholars do a root cause analysis, we see some similarities between cases in which people were ultimately vindicated by indisputable DNA evidence. And there are two classes of cases that keep coming up. One, eyewitness identification. We know now from DNA evidence cases that we don't witness things in the way that we think we do. Eyewitness identification is, is, is fairly unreliable. So identification evidence alone without other cooperative evidence is something that we should take a close look at. Second, confession. To most people, to most lay people, to most people outside of law enforcement, you think, well, why in the world would anyone confess to something that they didn't do? We now know from DNA cases that there are a lot of reasons why people confess. And a lot of people have confessed to things that they didn't do that DNA evidence absolutely excluded them from doing. Uh, so we know that there are innocent people, innocent people in jail who've spent years, decades uh, in jail before being freed from uh, or by DNA evidence. Ernesto Miranda um, was um, a defendant in a criminal case in Arizona. He was charged with rape. He was taken into custody, and he was questioned by Arizona police officers um, while he was alone in a police station um, for a lengthy period of time, and he eventually made a statement confessing to the rape. And when he was placed on trial, that confession was used as part of the evidence to convict him. And so the Supreme Court granted review of that conviction, along with several other companion cases that all involved people who had been interrogated in the same kind of circumstances. And what the court did in this case was to make a paradigm shift a shift in the essential way in which the court was going to view how the Constitution applied to the problem of police interrogation. Uh, prior to Miranda, the court used as the primary lens through which to view this problem um, the Due Process Clause. And the Due Process Clause is also part of the Fifth Amendment, and it's part of the Fourteenth Amendment, which makes it applicable to the states. So the Miranda warnings are an important aspect of our criminal law. Um, anyone who's ever watched television knows what the Miranda warnings are. You have the right to be silent. You have uh, a right to a lawyer. If you can't afford one, a lawyer will be given to you. If you give up your right to silence, then uh, that can and will be used against you in court. The genesis of the Miranda doctrine came from a recognition that uh, police custodial interrogation is inherently coercive. That is, most people, when they're encountered by police, uh, feel a sense of coercion that sometimes will make them say or do things that they otherwise would not do. So Miranda is and was designed as a prophylactic safeguard to guard against this sort of implicit coercion. Now, Miranda was not instituted on the notion that police officers were being purposefully coercive, but it was written from the perspective of the lay citizen that when someone uh, approaches you and they have you know, a gun on their side and probably one in their sock and a big stick and mace and these sorts of things, that it's not unreasonable for people to feel some sense of apprehension. So the central tenet of confessions in the criminal justice system is that those confessions are reliable. And if we don't have reliable confessions, then we can't have any faith in the legitimacy of our system of punishment.